Hi, I'm Alan McDaniel. Let's talk hypothyroidism. There are four things I want you to take home from this lecture, and I hope to prove them to you before I'm done. Thyroid hormone doses must be divided at least every 12 hours. Secondly, therapeutic blood levels should be tested according to peak and trough fluctuations. Thirdly, the total T3 to reverse T3 ratio is the best indicator of actual thyroid hormone function in the body. And some people will need to take T3 along with T4 for their best clinical results. Now, Tabers defines hypothyroidism as the consequences of inadequate thyroid hormone in the body. And that's correct. In the 19th century, they focused on the gland. But in the 21st century, we need to look at the hormones, T4, T3, reverse T3, at their various effects and how they interact with each other. Hypothyroidism is a really common problem here in the U.S. About 5% of us have TSH above 6. <clears throat> and that may be an underestimate. The problem is more common among women at a 4 to 1 ratio over men, as you can see from this table, and it significantly increases with age. Only at 40, it shoots way up. All of us with a license to practice can and really should treat hypothyroidism. Thyroid hormone is always among the top four most prescribed drugs on any list. Most hypothyroidism here in the West is related to autoimmune thyroiditis. It is the most common autoimmune disorder. In fact, NHANES 3 shows that 13% of us in the US have antibodies. And on autopsy, 27% of women and 7% of men have histological autoimmune thyroiditis, preserving that four to one female predominance. Other causes of hypothyroidism include post-ablative. That's the second most common, including radioiodine and surgical removal from the treatment for Graves' disease, cancer, or goiter. Congenital hypothyroidism is surprisingly common, one per 3,500 live births. This is diagnosed in the newborn nursery. <clears throat> Iodine deficiency does not usually cause hypothyroidism, even in endemic low iodine regions, but it will commonly cause goiters. High iodine <clears throat> actually causes pseudo-hypothyroidism. The gland becomes resistant to TSH to protect itself from the exposure to such high levels of iodine. Lithium doses that are used to treat type 1 bipolar can cause a toxic hypothyroidism by gumming up the sodium iodide supporter in up to 20% of users. And in these amounts, it much more often produces a, a multi-nodular goiter in over 40%. Now, the diagnosis is a little interesting because endocrine symptoms are notoriously nonspecific. In fact, official guidelines discourage us from using questionnaires. But other experts say knowledgeably people with multiple symptoms should be tested for thyroid. So I do use a questionnaire. I've got lots of symptoms on it. I have my patients self-score the severity from zero to four. It identifies who need tests. And also it gives me a baseline to mark progress. Now, do be cautious about interpreting symptoms because many symptoms of low thyroid are the symptoms of high thyroid as well. People with both low and high thyroid can complain of fatigue, heart palpitations, brain fog, bowel problems, hair loss, muscle weakness, hives, joint stiffness, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, menstrual irregularities, and more. And I'll show you why later. Some people don't even realize they've got symptoms. Uh, one of my patients with a hard gland, TSH above 50 and low free T4, resisted because she said she had no symptoms, but with repeated labs, she finally agreed to try treatment. And when she came back after six weeks, she was embarrassed to say her cognition had been her main problem. And then before I close this section, I want to remind you, the end stage of Graves' disease is low thyroid. So ask selected patients about a history of grave symptoms, you know, a huge appetite with no weight gain, having been underweight or being hot and shaky. Now, a physical exam of the thyroid is important. And after I felt the thyroid gland, many patients ask, what have you done? Nobody ever examined me there. And in fact, most internet images will show examiners are nowhere near the thyroid gland. Now, at Washington University, they got it right. So I want to show you the landmarks. 
uh, there are three equidistant points, the Adam's apple, the cricoid cartilage, and the trachea just below the thyroid isthmus. They're equidistant. So uh, you can see the examiner here with one, one finger on the cricoid and the thumb on the trachea underneath the isthmus. So I put two thumbs on either side of the trachea, and when you push up, the isthmus should roll under your thumbs. Anytime you can say absolutely, oh, the thyroid gland is right here, it's probably abnormal, and on a biopsy, you'll find it's due to fibrosis. In fact, the very worst glands can feel like overcooked liver, firm, but usually not enlarged, with the same pathological process as cirrhosis of the liver, which is to say regenerative nodules in a web of scar tissue. And sometimes look for the skin to flush. I see that with autoimmune thyroiditis. Now, on occasion, a disease gland will feel normal. So think about secondary signs of low thyroid. Don't expect to see myxedema as was described in 1870. But look for somebody who's wearing too many clothes for the temperature outside. Uh, cold hands and fingers, flaky, raggedy fingernails, a kind of slow pulse, a sluggish biceps reflex, thinning hair, and losing the lateral third of their eyebrows. And again, because most Graves patients end up low thyroid, especially if they've been subclinical and not previously diagnosed, look for the patient to have a low body mass index or inferior scleral shows under the eyebrow. It can be un under the eyelid. It can be normal, but not always. Nodules, we're not going to talk about them today, but there's an excellent free resource in thyroid 2016, 134 pages worth. Laboratory exam is essential. And if you need a reference for it, there it is from the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry. I want my workup to be thorough, even though experts tell me only test TSH. No, I'll show you why that's bogus. It's not too expensive. If you code it properly, insurance will pay. And uninsured patients can get really good bargain tests on the direct-to-consumer lab services online. When we get good, thorough results. It'll help us to diagnose correctly and to anticipate and avoid treatment complications. And who doesn't want that? So let's avoid some errors in lab use. And the first type of error is pre-analytical. So before the blood is drawn, have your patients stop their biotin supplements at least 48 hours before their tests, because biotin completely screws up immunoassays. Okay, and ask about other potentially interfering agents. Steroids of all sorts, including birth control pill and hormone replacement, factor those in. Amiodarone, which is a nightmare. Hormone-free glandulars have T3, sometimes even the adrenal glandulars. Prescription doses of lithium and iodine supplements more than one milligram a day can cause problems. Patients may not even know they're taking the iodine or they'll be cagey about it and not tell you. And then there are <clears throat> analytical errors. Heterophile antibodies are produced in our body and they interfere with immunoassay reports. As often it's an anti-mouse IgG. And if you think your results are being interfered with, order liquid chromatography tandem mass spec that is unaffected by this problem. Don't use blood spot assays, that's for screening newborns. It's not for adults. And then there's a whole raft of post-analytical errors that I paraphrase. The doc who ordered the test doesn't know what the results mean. And I'm not going to let you get away with that. So pay attention. Even TSH should not be taken at face value. Uh, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is considered the gold standard test for hypothyroidism because it becomes abnormal before the free T4 goes low when the gland is diseased. But then researchers tell us TSH is neither normatively fixed nor is it a precise marker of normal thyroid status. At best, TSH shows us the amount of free T4 within the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Uh, a big problem is the fact that clinical laboratories do not use a truly scientific normal range of TSH. If you look and analyze by the statistical method, the mean t median TSH value is 1.5, and minus 2 to plus 2 standard deviations is 0.4 to 2.9. So the upper limit of normal TSH was extended to match the results that we were getting treating people with levothyroxine. So over 20 years, the, the upper limit of normal has been reduced from 10 
to six to five and a half to four and a half in most national labs, but statistically, TSH of three is a high value. There are other ways it can be misleading. Again, it's commonly affected by heterophile antibody interference, and alas, there is no LC10 and mass spec test for TSH, it's too small a molecule. And then there's abnormal pulsatile TSH secretion. When the gland is damaged, TSH secretion goes from little pulses to big spiky pattern. And depending on when you test, it can look high or normal. And this is observed in the laboratory and proven, and it's observed in patients. And there are other issues too complex to even deal with right now. So I'm telling you test thyroid hormones, even though authorities say not to, I disagree. And I routinely order thyroid hormone levels, pre-T4, pre-T3, total T3 and reverse T3. So here's a little thyroid physiology we need to review. Tetraiodothyronine, C4 iodine thyroid molecule alanine subchain, my favorite amino acid, is 90% of what is released by the thyroid gland into the bloodstream. <clears throat> Once it gets into the blood, the great majority, 99.97% of T4, is carried on binding carrier, bound to carrier proteins. And the protein binding is good. It makes the hydrophobic hormone soluble in the aqueous bloodstream. It protects it from being peed out in the urine or chewed up in the liver, and it gives us a large inactive but ready reserve of hormone should we need it. Now, our assays are so sensitive, like the picograms per milliliter. Look at all those zeros. That's a picogram. Most of us practitioners really like the ability to order free tests. One, because only free hormones actually enter the cell to take a genomic effect, so we feel it's good. And two, total hormone tests are easily distorted when the liver production of binding proteins is altered by the birth control pill, pregnancy, hormone replacement, insulin resistance, liver or kidney disease, severe illness, all of these factors. But the single most important part of the physiology I want you guys to remember is this. T4 is a pre-hormone with little genomic effect. So why does my gland release a pre-hormone instead of active? Well, it's for the same reason Campbell's puts soups into cans instead of hot steaming bowls because cans are safe to transport. They've got a long shelf life. And if you want soup, just open the can, no problem. So how do you open the thyroid? To activate T4, deiodinase enzymes inside the cell, take one thiodine, iodine atom from the outer ring of the thyroid, the prime ring, to make T3. T3 sets the thermostat of the metabolism. It has genomic effects on the DNA to increase your cell metabolism and every activity, and it impedes any DNA program that slows them down. Conversely, if you remove this iodine atom from the inner ring of T4, you make reverse T3. And everyone agrees reverse T3 has absolutely zero stimulatory effect. So reverse T3 marks the downregulation of thyroid hormone effect during stress of all kinds, including injury, illness, starvation, or even psychological stress. So it's essential for us to monitor our treatment. We have to realize the deiodination of T4, either T3 or reverse T3, determines thyroid hormone function at the cell level. And this processing is tightly controlled know that it is the primary means of regulating the biological activity of thyroid hormone. In fact, the ratio of T3 to reverse T3 is the single best indicator of thyroid hormone activity, both in research and in clinical use, and there are your references. So we should measure the ratio of T3 to reverse T3. We have to compare total T3, though, because our laboratory reports only total reverse T3. There's not enough of it to measure a free. And because the four thyroid hormone proteins vary, the T3 RT3 ratio must be calculated comparing total T3 to total reverse T3 apples to apples. And every effort that compares free T3 to total reverse T3 will fail in hot published journals and in books like Madness. So in summary, we measure thyroid hormones because, number one, 
Blood tests of thyroid hormones are reliable. They have been proven to accurately reflect the amount of hormone in tissues. Two, T4 levels validate the TSH assay. And three, T3 and reverse T3 show us how the T4 is being processed and patient two will show us how we put this into use. The value of analyzing these multiple parameters has been supported in the recent medical literature. So let's look at the cause of the hypothyroidism so we can treat it right. Is the gland palpably abnormal? Test both thyroid autoantibodies, thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin. The literature now supports the importance for testing thyroglobulin antibodies. Thank you. Prior Graves disease maybe, or a question of autonomous function? I order a TSH receptor antibody. It's an immunoassay. It's faster and it's a less expensive option than the alternative, which is a, the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, a biological assay using living mouse cells. And when you do these tests, it helps us to predict unreliable TSH values and anticipate autonomous function. Not on everybody, but be suspicious. Remember, antibody tests can be false negative because Hashimoto's is primarily a T cell mediated disease. I didn't know this years ago. Autopsy series have found that up to 10% of glands with histological Hashimoto's are antibody negative. And these are new studies. Those are recent tests. So history, physical exam, ultrasound, test hormones. Now there are other, we've mentioned less common causes of low thyroid post ablative, you know, Take a history, look for the surgical scar. Nutritional and toxic issues do exist. So now, treat the hypothyroidism successfully. Now, the experts tell us how they want us to do it. Oh, use levothyroxine. And it's biologically identical T4. But remember, it's a pre-hormone. The proponents tell us, oh, only the required T3 will be made, and that's safe. But critics like me ask, can the patient make enough T3? Does the body have a can opener? Okay. Guidelines tell us treat patients whose TSH value is greater than 10. And if the value is somewhere between 5 and 10, they'll call it subclinical hypothyroidism, regardless of symptoms. It should be sublaboratory hypothyroidism. So they want us to treat only if the T4 has gone low. Before you treat in any event, be sure you assess the patient's age and overall health, like heart conditions, okay? The nature of the thyroid disease, so you know what you're getting into, and the status of other endocrine systems. The adrenal gland is essential, gotta support it. And estrogen is important, it'll show up in menopause too, because thyroid treatment can provoke symptoms of low estrogen. Now, before you treat, ask your patient, what hormone do you wanna use? Does the patient prefer natural? You'd be an idiot to try to convince that patient to take levothyroxine, okay? You'll lose them. But let's first discuss orthodox levothyroxine. The patient comes in with an open mind and you're open-minded. So before you do any treatment, give the patient informed consent talk. My goal, I'm a surgeon, so I see talk as natural. My goal is to restore optimum thyroid hormone effect on the cells to resolve your symptoms and signs of hypothyroidism and good blood levels are both my guide and my ultimate goal and the method I use to monitor therapy. Now there is an option once you've achieved this to give slightly more thyroid hormone to suppress TSH. And that's handy if you have a person who has had thyroid cancer treatment or has a goiter you wanna shrink. What harm can we do? Well, if we give too much hormone or we're stingy and give too little, we harm the patient. Or if a patient self-medicates themselves according to whim, oh, my muscle testing says I don't need thyroid today, smack them. Uh, otherwise, harm occurs only if a patient will choke on a pill or is allergic to some component of the tablet. So I tell them, look, I'm an authority figure. Follow my directions, no ad living. Do what I tell you. I explain the therapeutic dose response. Too little treatment does nothing. When you give more and more, they get better and better. And when you give just the right amount, that's as good as they can get for what they're taking. And if they take more, they're not gonna get gooder, they just get worse from taking too much. So in trusting my history, physical and lab findings, we expect treatment to do good things. How do you start T4 treatment? Well, guidelines 
optimistically tell us that oh, almost everyone can start with a full dose unless they're elderly or infirm. But I, I don't believe that. I always start low and gradually increase the dose, whether I'm treating with T4 or natural or T3. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's imperative to start low and build up gradually when you're using T3, anything with T3. So for levothyroxine, I prescribe the smallest tablet made, which actually is scored and can be have to give me the smallest accurate increment. To what daily dose should we build? We have to plan ahead of time before we write the prescription. Although typical T4 doses vary all over the lot, we know that lean body mass is the best predictor of the ultimate T4 dose. So guidelines show us when TSH is markedly elevated, bigger than 10, the usual daily maximum is 1.6 micrograms per kilogram of body weight or 0.73 micrograms per pound. So my patients start taking 12.5 mics of T4 every 12 hours, like a half a tablet of 25Q12. I don't expect any problems with this. I will increase the dose by 25 micrograms weekly as tolerated, key piece of information. I use a Microsoft fill-in form and I give written directions, which I send to the patient by email the next day after the first visit. And typically I will bring people back before they've reached the estimated maximum dose. That's for safety. So this is the orders for a person I think uh, may end up needing 125 micrograms of T4 a day. Bring them back sooner. Now, if you guys have been listening, you heard me say every 12 hours, and you may think, what kind of a crazy man, why is he giving levothyroxine every 12 hours? Well, think about it, okay? If my goal is to restore normal hormone levels, why would I give thyroid hormone once a day? That is so not physiological. The healthy thyroid gland releases hormones continuously through the day. These are daily blood levels of T4 and T3. There is virtually no significant variation. Look at the uh, axis here. The, the values are stable. Even TSH, which we all know goes up overnight while we sleep, varies by only plus or minus 0 0.6. So hormone levels are steady through the day, and my patients do best with steady physiological levels. So I want you to think about it. Why do we all think thyroid hormone should be given once a day? And it's because it was a marketing strategy for Synthroid in 1957, when they're trying to take something that was more expensive and new and find an advantage over the standard used inexpensive natural thyroid. So, are divided doses really better than once a day? Well, I'd love to show you the pharmacokinetics of T4, but they don't exist because the FDA cleared the use of the drug before we had the ability to do these studies. So I have to take another similar drug, methadone, which has the same peak value at three hours that we know occurs for T4, and show you once daily versus twice daily divided doses. And you can see right after a dose, the uh, peak, is supra-physiologic. It stays above physiologic for hours, falls through the therapeutic range, and then becomes low at the end of the day. Whereas if you simply divide it, take half as much twice as often, you are always in the physiological levels. Thank you, Dr. Levitt. So divided doses keep your patient's blood level in the physiologic range. Okay, now during dose escalation, Every time the patient builds a dose at the end of that week, she's going to ask herself, am I better? Do I feel the same or do I feel worse? And then decide what the next step is going to be. Should I build the dose again? Not if she feels worse. If unexpectedly the patient feels worse, she needs to reduce the dose one step and then contact me. Now, during this escalation phase, absolutely the most common reason people unexpectedly feel worse is because of overstimulation from caffeine. Look, hypothyroid people need energy and caffeine is both legal and abundant. So most of my patients are taking high levels of caffeine, but as you build the thyroid doses from low and they approach normal, suddenly the high caffeine makes the person hyper. And of course, they blame my thyroid treatment. So before starting, I tell all my patients, taper your caffeine off and stop when you reach a pretty high dose and see there's the rest of the directions that I give them.
once you've proven the patient is on the right thyroid dose, they can go back on their caffeine. It's still my drug of choice. I love coffee. So thyroid replacement can also reveal symptoms of low blood sugar and of estrogen deficiency. So you ask for these questions, but if you can find no explanation at all, ask a patient to continue the newly lowered dose, wait two weeks and check blood levels. And we'll talk about some of the other things you can find later. But it's unusual to get a call. People very rarely feel worse during T4 escalation. So I scheduled my first follow-up for the end of the planned escalation, four weeks in the illustration I showed you. And by design, she's taking less than my estimated maximum. So how is she doing? It's the Dr. Phil question. How's it working for you? If she's 100% well, good. Maintain that dose, wait two weeks, and check blood. Now, some people want to wait four weeks or longer. That's okay with me. If the patient's not 100% well and she doesn't have any evidence of over-replacement, I go to small half-step increments, 12.5 micrograms a week, as tolerated to reach the estimated maximum dose, at which we wait two weeks and check blood levels. Now, let me reassure you guys, anytime you don't know how to proceed, it is always okay to stop and check blood levels because properly timed results are the best guide for our decisions. So here is another pre-analytical decision. We want follow-up lab tests. Our patient is taking levothyroxine every 12 hours. When should we draw her blood tests? The first thing, do not test at random because those peak and trough levels I showed you make that unreliable. Our internist friends usually test at trough before the morning dose. And that gives you the lowest blood level all day. It'll show under treatment, but it can completely miss over treatment. And I'll show you a case later. Uh, a famous Colorado healthcare study showed that in 2000. Now, some of our European endocrinologists draw blood at peak three hours after the dose. And this shows the highest the blood levels get all day. And it will prevent over treatment, but they can completely miss under treatment. And if they're doing it one a day, they will miss it. So lacking the pharmacokinetic information that I would like, I decided from what I heard at a meeting to test my patient's blood levels exactly midway between evenly timed divided doses. And there I'm a visual learner. So there's a picture of it. And you can see half the day the levels are higher, half the day the levels are lower. We get an average. Whenever you draw blood tests and you get a report in, document the dose and the timing of the dose. So whenever I receive a lab report, I send my patients this little macro by email. And I ask them to fill in the blanks and return it. And I put it on their chart record so I know exactly what they were taking when the blood was drawn. And it uh, really makes the test useful. When you don't have this, it's frustrating. Patient one will illustrate this peak trough mid-dose issue, okay? Uh, she was taking 125 of T4 every morning. Her endocrinologist tested her at trough, and her values were elevated TSH 5.2. Pre-T4 was quite modest. Pre-T3 was modest also. Her endocrinologist said, you need more treatment. Increased her T4 dose by 25, so now she's taking 150 in the morning, and she felt no better, so she came to me and said, take over. Well, she didn't quite let me take over. I wanted to divide her dose of 150 to 75 Q12 and test her mid-dose, but she didn't want to wait two weeks to feel better. So we tested her at the end of the day, just before the lab closed, as close as possible to mid-dose. And these were the values we got. TSH 0.48, almost low. Free T4 was high. Free T3 was just as modest as it had been before. And reverse T3 was really ugly high. So testing at mid-dose works well in my practice. And you can use anything you want to do. I have no objection. And I won't ever complain if you're consistent and you've minimized your pre-analytical error and you understand the pros and cons of the method of choice. When I get my first follow-up labs, I think it's essential to obtain all five. TSH, free T4, free T3, total T3, and total reverse T3. And this is especially true if the patient's symptoms are not doing as well as I'd like them to, uh, either mine or from somebody else. So what is the ideal therapeutic TSH? 
It's a matter of opinion, but I and most people around here like to keep it between 0.5 and 2.0, okay? Now, if suppressing TSH is your goal because you really want to shrink a goiter, make sure your patient feels well under treatment because if she doesn't and you give her more treatment, she's gonna feel worse, okay? Now here are the challenges to leave with thyroxin treatment. Not everybody does well. And there are a number of problems that have been identified. As we noted, TSH values are commonly poor, either from patient non-adherence or undesirable physician technique. Pharmacies will give the wrong doses and have. And some of the difficult patients have autonomous function the gland is doing its own thing. Hypothyroid graves, toxic multinodular goiter, hashitoxicosis, a functioning adenoma. And because of this autonomy, your calculated replacement dose may give them more than they can tolerate. It's unfortunate. There are spurious elevated TSH. And so if the patient's thyroid is absolutely fine and the TSH is falsely elevated, you're not gonna make them better by giving them T4. You just hope you stop before you make them worse. So look at all five labs and you can see which one doesn't match the others. It's like the Sesame Street song. But the big challenge with levothyroxine is the fact that up to 16% of people have poor results on T4 despite normal tests for TSH and free T4. And this minority has become increasingly angry about it. And I'm sure a lot of you recognize these books. After 60 years, these patients have finally gotten academic attention. In a big multi-center study of over 2,000 patients, they like natural thyroid significantly more than they like levothyroxine. So here's a patient who shows it. She's 31 years old, hypothyroid for 14 years because of Hashimoto's. Her TSH and T4 are normal, but she was not happy taking the levothyroxine 112 micrograms a morning because she had had three confirmed fourth trim first trimester miscarriages and likely a fourth in only two years. And she had many symptoms of low thyroid and even some adrenal issues were suggested. Uh, she was on a good diet. She was gluten-free. Her father has celiac. Her body mass index was 19.6. And I asked her to do two things, divide the T4 dose to 56 micrograms Q12 and start nutrition for her adrenal gland, the neonatal bovine adrenal glandular. We waited two weeks, we checked her blood levels and her TSH was fine. Her free T4 was robust, her free T3 was not. Total T3 was puny and her reverse T3 was sky high. So calculating her total T3 reverse T3, we got 2.4. And I will later show you why healthy is between 10 and 14. So she was bad. And we agreed that she was not activating her T4 to T3. So let us replace some of the T4 with T3. Using the semi-equivalency, 25 of T4 is about the same as five of T3, a five to one ratio equivalency. And these were the type instructions I gave her. After 56 Q12, we went to 50 and 50 of T4, giving her 2.5 and 2.5 of T3. Then every week we replaced 25 micrograms of T4 with five micrograms of T3, going stepwise as tolerated. Finally, we got her the T4, 25 and 12 and a half and T3, 10 and 10, and she felt great. We tested her. So blood was drawn six hours after these Q12 doses. Her TSH was unchanged. I did good with the five to one. Her T4 was a little low. Free T3 was excellent. Total T3, great. Reverse T3, great. Her T3, RT3 ratio was actually a little high. And it was a little high because her T4 was a little low and her T4 was a little low because she was pregnant. When you get pregnant, your binding proteins go up, so more replacement is needed. So we ended up putting her on T4, 37 and a half Q12, T3, 10 Q12 through the pregnancy and she delivered this outstanding little baby boy at full term. In the postpartum, she reduced her dose back down. During the second pregnancy, which was also successful, she took the same larger dose and had another healthy boy. So she raises two really key issues. Number one, levothyroxine restored her TSH and free T4 to normal ranges, but her body could not efficiently activate the T4 to T3, and her reverse T3 was excessive. So 
Why did I tell her first to divide the T4 dose? I'll tell you, because a single big dose of T4 floods the liver in your bloodstream with a whole day's worth of hormone in one rush. And that sends a message to our body, oh, you're hyperthyroid, right? During the liver first pass and those high peak levels in the blood. So the deoxygenase enzymes in our body, big bunch of them in our liver, make reverse T3 instead of T3 when T4 is high and when the T4 to TSH ratio is also high, typical of once a day dosing. Now look, converting T4 to reverse T3 can be adaptive. In Graves' disease, this is protective. But when you're giving somebody T4 for hypothyroidism, it is not protective. And without exception, once daily, oral levothyroxine produces higher than normal reverse T3 levels in men and animals in every study I've ever found that looked at it. So dividing her T4 doses though didn't help her, alas. She had dysfunctional deiodination. You see in normal health, 80% of T3 a human gets is made from T4. But you take a hypothyroid person on T4, she's gotta make 100% of her T3 and not everyone can do it. 16% of Britons, my homies, have mutated DIO2 gene. So they've lost the function of the enzyme that makes 50 to 70% of their T3 in a day. And these mutated patients have been proven to respond much better to combined therapy with T4 and T3 than they do to T4 alone. Now patient two also has Hashimoto's with a high reverse T3 on T4. And we know the Hashimoto's is strongly associated with excessive reverse T3, even when not on any treatment at all. Look at all those zeros in that p-value. And other factors will contribute to dysfunctional deiodination, including a variety of drugs, steroids, beta blockers, epinephrine, amiodarone, iodine deficiency, cytokines, endotoxin, and mycotoxin, the metabolic syndrome, and cancer, and particularly stress. Stress directs T4 to reverse T3. In fact, the acute stress response slows our metabolism to keep us alive by reducing TSH release and peripheral production of T3. Even emotional stress can rapidly initiate this response when patients go in an operating room or even into the pre-op area or when medical students sit down to take exams. This has all been shown. Again, this is adaptive in serious injury, illness, and starvation, but it is maladaptive when it is inappropriately prolonged in the euthyroid 6 syndrome, also called non-thyroidal illness. So how do we diagnose this? Not by low T3. Now some patients only with thyroxine do have low T3. And when this occurs, the low T3 correlates with their low thyroid symptoms, duh. But low T3 does not define euthyroid 6 syndrome on the ICU. In fact, in 1980, it used to be called the low T3 syndrome, but it didn't apply, so they stopped it. In fact, you can have disrupted thyroid hormone signaling while T3 remains normal. And patient two had normal free and total T3. Now, elevated reverse T3 was present for patient two. It's characteristic and when it's found, it predicts a bad outcome. But reverse T3 alone is insensitive. Dr. Peters and his group in Holland proved that the low total T3 reverse T3 ratio is 10 times more significant than is a simply elevated reverse T3. In fact, total T3 to reverse T3 is a better indicator of thyroid hormone signaling than is TSH. Now, why is reverse T3 so important? <clears throat> because it inhibits T3. Yes, yes, the effects of T3 can be blocked. There is an inhibitory thyroid hormone metabolite called 3 monoiodothyronamine that rapidly causes tissue hypothyroidism. <clears throat> and everybody agrees on this. This is not controversial. So in my next two slides, I've listed a lot of the evidence that shows reverse T3 is also inhibitory. And there's too much to look at, so I'm going to pick out this one and another one later. T3 cannot displace reverse T3 that is bound to and blocking the thyroid hormone receptor in the cell nucleus and vice versa. 
So T3 and reverse T3 have the same relationship to each other as histamine and antihistamine. I'd like you guys to think about that. Also, reverse T3 deactivates both enzymes that convert T4 to T3, both type 2 and type 1. So how are you going to make T3 when all the enzymes that do that are deactivated? So T3 stimulates and reverse T3 blocks nuclear receptors. And the ratio of total T3 to reverse T3 quantitates the thyroid hormone effect. So what ratio do we want? Well, remember, thyroid hormones exit the gland into the bloodstream in a 10 to 1 ratio, 90% T4, 9% T3, 0.9% reverse T3. So a total T3 to reverse T3 ratio greater than 10 indicates activation of T4 to T3, and a value less than 10 implies deactivation. Now, three studies have actually measured the total T3 reverse T3 ratio in healthy controls, and their values range from 11 to 12 and a half with very narrow individual variation. And I'll tell you, my patients feel well in the 10 to 14 range, maybe a little higher for teenagers. So there are patients who do not benefit from levothyroxin and they need T3. There's a 2012 review in a Primo Primo journal that showed most comparison trials have proven that replacement with both T4 and T3 is superior to T4 only. So now, finally, endocrine experts both locally and internationally state that combined T4 plus T3 therapy can improve results for at least some hypothyroid patients. The long-term safety of combined treatment is proven. It's not speculative. And patient two shows us the simplest and generally accepted method. Just replace some of the ineffective T4 with active T3. How does replacing T4 with T3 improve the ratio? I mean, we usually reduce the T4 dose when adding T3, right? Well, here's the key. 95% of reverse T3 is derived from T4. So when I reduce T4, that means there's less reverse T3. And when I give T3 to treatment, there's more T3 in the blood. So now we've got a healthy ratio. Patient two, when we replaced her, these, this is her first and her latest test results. You can see the TSH was virtually the same using this 5 to 1 equivalency. And uh, her T3 RT3 balance was vastly improved. So these are numbers I like. And those two little boys of hers show us it's not a bad idea. So repeat for emphasis for you guys, you have to divide T3 doses. It's got too short a half-life to try giving it once a day. And I have a lot of people even around here who give natural thyroid once a day, bad idea. In healthy people, a single dose of T3 peaks at two and a half hours and bottoms out at 12 hours, it's gone. So my more sensitive patients actually prefer taking their thyroid every eight hours, which just happens to have been the way Sir William Osler did it in 1901, the greatest physician of the 20th century. Now, because T4 and T3 is more potent than T4 alone, you will more frequently see problems with correctly prescribed treatment, as I've described earlier. So the escalation phase is just like T4, but more fraught with hazard because the caffeine use is more noticeable and people can get anxious and jittery and shaky not because of too much T3, but because of reactive low blood sugar. People on a bad diet, now their blood sugar can go high because they've got T3 on board and what goes up must come down and they get hypoglycemic. They make adrenaline to push their blood sugar up and they think it's your thyroid. So I put, I'd like to recommend a Mediterranean diet or paleo or keto or candida or whatever to get the sugar and starch out of my patient's diets. You can induce low estrogen symptoms, and that will be confused sometimes with an overdose of thyroid. How do you tell? Well, because the symptoms are not related to T3 peak and trough. That's how you tell, and you do a blood test for estrogen and thyroid. When people miss doses, it'll have greater consequences because they're actually taking active hormone now. If people ignore your directions and take more than recommended, that's a bad thing. I mean, some people like being a little wired, but it is not a good long-term policy. It's a little risky. 
And again, people may forget the dose response curve and keep taking more and more and more thinking they should get better and better when they won't. So you have to keep people um, following up appropriately. Occasionally, you will meet a patient who simply cannot tolerate total T3. I've had two, and one of them had so much chemotherapy and radiation, his mitochondria were dead. And another poor dear had four psychiatric drugs, all of which disrupt mitochondria, and neither of them could handle any T3. Don't let your people skip follow-up. Lack of follow-up is bad, especially if they're taking T3. So make timely follow-up appointments and insist the patient keeps them. Do not give them open-ended prescription for a year of treatment. Give them just enough tablets to bring them back a little bit safe. And like Seinfeld soup Nazi, don't give them thyroid if they're not coming to you for proper follow-up. Blood tests will confirm safety and effectiveness. And again, with the labile T3 levels, you have to test midway between doses, I think. And uh, I see a lot of patients who have problems because of not having that done. So here's a little graph of what I think are desirable levels. Uh, you can say I like to get my T3s in the uh, upper quarter of normal, my uh, TSH, T4, and reverse T3 down in the lower quarter of normal. Um, now these ideal therapeutic levels on oral T4 and T3 are different from the normal reference intervals that the lab gives you. Why? Number one, the patient is not healthy and probably has deiodination problems. And number two is these hormones are taken orally. Remember, not only is every 12 hours not really physiological, but the oral hormones are altered by the liver during the hepatic first pass. So with oral hormones, I like to see good blood levels, meaning free T3 around 3.7 to 4.0, free T4 between 0.6, yes, the lab says it's low, and 0.8, the lab may say it's low, and the T3 RT3 ratio between 10 and 14. That's your money shot. Now, I will remind you, please keep the free T4 above 0.60, even though ARUP says it's normal. People need some T4. It's the precursor of, T of T3 and reverse T3. Also, T4 and reverse T3 have a lot of non-genomic functions, which our body needs. And we know that people taking T3 with immeasurably low T4 do badly. So how much T4 does my patient need? Keep his reverse T3 in the normal range. Reverse T3 is the normal range. It's the best indicator for normal T4. So I suggest when the initial TSH is normal, use T4 5 micrograms equal 1 microgram of T3 equivalency with 5 to 1. Make small steps as tolerated to avoid getting the T3 too high. And once the T4 dose falls to 70% of the total thyroid hormone, maintain that dose and check blood levels after two weeks. If those blood levels show the T3, RT3 ratio was still low, you can make the adjustments you need. The lab values will tell you if she needs both less T4 and more T3, or if she needs either less T4 or a little more T3. See, patient two is fine today, taking 74% T4 and 26% T3. So big L. Compared to a healthy human thyroid, which gives only 10% of T3, or natural pig thyroid, which contains 20% T3, why do I need to give so much T3? Number one, because these patients have dysfunctional deiodination. And number two, because some of the oral T3 is lost during the liver first pass. So we accommodate for that with clinical indicators and blood tests, easy. So what are the alternatives to using T4 to start treatment? Well, there's desiccated thyroid porcine USP, it's valid. Uh, I will call it USP or natural. Uh, some of the modern writers are calling it desiccated thyroid extract or DTE. It's been used since 1892. And when I was a sophomore medical student, my pharmacology book said it's excellent, highly satisfactory. Patients are more satisfied using it than they are with T4. And most of us prescribers who give natural do so because it contains T3 and because our patients ask for it. The best indication for starting with natural thyroid is hypothyroidism with a low total T3 to RT3 ratio. You are not gonna make that better giving levothyroxine, okay? The contraindication is allergy to pork from which the hormone comes. 
And a relative contraindication is either religious or philosophical objection to pork because it's not kosher or vegan, okay? You do the same pretreatment evaluation and same informed consent as you do for levothyroxine and add these cautions. Because natural thyroid contains T3, issues with caffeine and low blood sugar are more likely to be seen. And other providers may try to replace natural thyroid, which they think of as dirty and unreliable, with T4, which we know doesn't work that well. As is true for T4 dosing, optimal thyroid is with natural is best related to lean body mass. And I think your maximum for a healthy adult is 0.45 milligrams per kilogram per day, or how easy is this? One milligram of natural per pound of body weight, lean body weight, lean body weight. The half-life of T3 is brief, six hours. So you have to divide natural thyroid doses every 12 or every eight. I start the smallest tablets, 15 milligram to easily adjust those. My patients, my adults start taking 15 milligrams of natural thyroid every 12 hours and gradually increase the dose once a week. Do not start a full dose of natural thyroid. It's just too risky because hypothyroidism increases the population of nuclear thyroid hormone receptors. And this large number of hungry receptors is very sensitive to replacement T3 especially if you give too much too fast. So our patients have to understand as tolerated before they start taking any thyroid preparation containing T3. So I give the same type of written directions I give as I give the T4. Start natural thyroid 15 Q12, cut your caffeine dose. Next week as tolerated 30 Q12, cut your caffeine again. And as I did before, I bring people back before they reach the estimated maximum. Remember, all dose increases are conditional depending on the, whether the patient feels better, same or worse. So we proceed just as I've described previously. And usually everything goes smoothly. Now there are some problems that are intrinsic specifically to the use of natural thyroid. It contains antigens from the pig's thyroid gland. So it's not just allergic to pork. People with autoimmune thyroiditis can flare up their gland by adding those pig antigens. It's alarming. Usually if you can keep the patient on it and suppress TSH, it completely goes away. Also, it is absolutely necessary to divide doses, as I've said, because the T3 doesn't last long. And if you give all that T4 at once, it'll go to reverse T3. So here's a patient, number three, who came to me taking 90 milligrams of natural every morning. And Rather than wait two weeks, she had her blood drawn 12 hours after the morning dose. And uh, we see that her reverse T3 is pretty robust and her, free T her total T3 RT3 ratio not very good. So I started working with her. I divided her thyroid dose. I gave her a little bit more because I thought she needed it. And then I tested her six hours after the morning dose. Her TSH was virtually the same. Pre T4 was more. Reverse T3 was less, and her T3-RT3 ratio was better than twice as good on a little bit larger dose of T4 simply by dividing her doses. So here's another problem. Just about the time your patient starts feeling really good on the natural thyroid, and they've got great blood levels of T4, T3, and reverse T3, their TSH goes low. Now, that to me is no problem as long as the thyroid hormones are normal because low TSH has no definite psych physiological drawback. You know, low TSH doesn't damage bones, it's high T4 that damages bones, and there's a good reference for it. And low TSH will allow goiters to shrink, and it starves micrometastases. But some of our colleagues who are less informed will incorrectly assume that a low TSH means your patient is hyperthyroid, so your patient has to understand this in order to defend her use of natural hormone. So again, patients respond to natural do, uh, de, dose escalation incrementally. Most people, every time you increase the dose, you feel better, 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 like climbing a ladder. But a few people feel no better until they hit the optimal dose and they suddenly zoom up. Boom! Perfect. So at the first follow-up office visit on natural thyroid, you can proceed as I've already described. If the patient is just right, do a blood test. If she still seems underdosed, increased by smaller increments of just 15 milligrams a day, a week, 
until she's either well or reaches her best, her calculated maximum dose. And then you check blood levels after waiting for her to equilibrate. Now we can also use natural thyroid when T4 treatment has failed. And a lot of people like to do that. Um, everybody around us is now starting to replace T4 with T3. But for years and years, we've been replacing T4 with natural. And there's several valid ways to do this. First is an approximate equivalency. 25 micrograms of T4 is about the same as 15 milligrams of natural thyroid. Smallest tablet made of each. It's just handy that way. <clears throat> so take your person, give them her T4 with 25 microgram tablets, prescribe 15 milligram natural thyroid tablets, divide the daily T4 dose, and then just replace 25 micrograms of T4 with 15 milligrams of T3, and you move as predictable. Here's a caution though, because the approximate equivalency is not exact. And a person who comes into you on 100 micrograms of T4 a day will not be exactly the same when she's on 30 milligrams of natural thyroid twice a day, as implied. So most people you will need to give still more natural thyroid after they stop taking the T4. It's no big deal as long as you know to look for it. Secondly, you can use the natural thyroid according to its content of T4 and T3. And this is really useful. Remember, 60 milligrams of natural contains 38 micrograms of T4 and nine micrograms of T3. So if T4 treatment is not working, test all five, you'll see whether the patient only needs more T3 or whether she needs both less T4 and added T3. And then you can substitute in the natural with real finesse remembering only 20% of hormone in natural is T3. So natural thyroid hormone can fail, it does. And this post-analytical analysis is key. There are lots of reasons that natural thyroid may fail. I've seen scores of people who did badly on natural. And the most common cause is dysfunctional deiodination of the T4. They simply needed more T3 and less T4 than is in the natural. Patient two, for example, basically needs to take 30% T3 and 70% T4. And natural thyroid wouldn't have been so good for her. Patient four is a man, a pilot, an engineer, and he also needs more T3 than he can get in his natural. One of my friends, uh, patient 468, one of my friends transitioned him from levothyroxine the natural thyroid, and he felt better, but the lab test showed he still wasn't doing as well as he should, and he didn't feel that well either. So here are his tests, all five at mid-dose. Low TSH shows he is fully replaced, and he is taking too much T4, as you can see from the free T4 that's higher than my goal, and a pretty darn robust reverse T3 with a poor T3 RT3 ratio. His T3 is relatively good at 3.6. So what does he need? He needs less T4 and the same T3. So we agreed to adjust his intake. I gave him two options. I said, look, we can replace some of your T4 with T3. By this uh, equivalency, 15 milligrams of natural is about equal to five micrograms of T3. See, now you've gotten all of the conversion factors. It's not exact, but it's not bad or we can adjust T4 and T3 individually. For instance, since 60 milligrams of natural is really 38 of T4 and nine micrograms of T3, if we give him 2.5 micrograms of T3 and reduce his natural thyroid by 15 micrograms, he's getting exactly the same T3 and he's got 9.5 micrograms less T4. You can see how precisely you can do this work. But he's an engineer. He said, look, just switch me to T4 and T3 individually. All right, okay. So his daily 120 milligrams of natural thyroid gave him 76 of T4 and 18 of T3 daily. So I simply changed him to levothyroxine 75 micrograms daily and liothyronine 20 micrograms daily, also divided Q12. And then while we maintained his T3 at 10 micrograms Q12, I simply reduced his T4 in small steps by 12 and a half micrograms a week to 37 and a half Q12 to 25 Q12, I'm sorry, I misspoke, it's 25 micrograms per week to 12 and a half micrograms per week. 12 and a half micrograms Q12 <laughs> Well, here he was before 
uh, drawn at mid dose on natural thyroid 60 milligrams Q12. And here he is at mid dose on T4, 12 and a half Q12 and T3, 10 Q12. You can see TSH is back to normal. Pre-T4 is low according to the lab, but I know it's not low because his reverse T3 is normal and his T3, RT3 is exactly where I would have it. So here are a few challenging situations we're gonna talk about before we wrap this dog. Um, some people think this is the hardest situation, a patient with no thyroid gland. Actually, he's, that's an easy case because her thyroid function is stable. There just isn't any of it. So she has no endogenous safety net if you get the doses wrong. So you gotta be smart prescribe T4 and T3 in divided doses so that when the patient hits a trough, they don't bottom out, okay? So easy. Now, this is harder because thyroid function can keep changing. You have to keep following your patient, remain alert and adaptable. A lot of people have a progressive loss of thyroid function. When we treat patients Hashimoto's and maintain a TSH of two, that means the residual thyroid continues to make hormones and we're depending on them to keep our levels where they are. If thyroiditis continues to destroy the gland, the gland will make less and less hormones, so we have to give them more and more. So follow their blood levels annually. Harder is autonomous function when the residual thyroid gland releases hormones independently of hypothalamic pituitary feedback. That makes our job harder. The simplest is hashitoxicosis, and it can occur in up to 10% of cases of Hashimoto's disease. Stored hormones in the thyroid gland, there should be a maximum three month supply, are released from the colloid as the gland is being destroyed by the autoimmune process, and that can cause transient hyperthyroidism or throw off our doses. This will usually go away in two to three months, suppress the TSH, hang in there. Graves is even harder. It has a phenomenon called switching. Uh, in Graves, high thyroid comes from TSH receptor stimulating antibodies, but we also know that many Graves patients also make TSH receptor blocking antibodies. And whether the gland is high or low depends on the predominant TSH receptor antibody is being produced at that moment. And so Graves patients can switch from high to low to high to low again, and I have a slide I deleted, but it can make you crazy. And I understand why some doctors want to just kill the gland. Now, pregnancy and female hormones are important because they cause the liver to greatly increase the amount of thyroid binding proteins, okay? For instance, up to 80% of hypothyroid women, when they become pregnant, will need at up to 45% more replacement during the pregnancy. And there is nice free download on American Thyroid Association pregnancy guidelines, some 80 pages. Uh, you want to test promptly when the pregnancy is diagnosed, repeat tests every four weeks thereafter. And I like to maintain my TSHs too. They say to keep T4 above the 10th centile, but they make no mention of T3. They make no mention of T3 or T3. Alas, so you have to kind of learn to do it on your own. And hypothyroidism is definitely related to first trimester miscarriage as patient two showed us. So be bold. In pregnancy, order the usual five thyroid tests. And remember that even though the total values of total T3 and total reverse T3 are up here somewhere, their binding constants are the same and the ratio is valid for comparison all the way through pregnancy. After delivery, you can relieve, we can reduce the thyroid hormone dose again, usually about six weeks postpartum. And the same consideration to a less severe extent is present with hypothyroid women who start the birth control pill or start hormone replacement, or on the other end who stop both of those. That changes the thyroid binding proteins. You need to test them and make sure they're still getting the right amount of thyroid replacement when they do these things. Now, here's a real conundrum for scientists. Subclinical hypothyroidism, I've touched on before. TSH is elevated between 5 and 10, and the free T4 is still normal. And there's a big controversy around this because of a very simple paradox. Many studies show no benefit from levothyroxine treatment until the TSH rises above 10 or the T4 goes low. However, many other studies have shown that untreated subclinical patients have worse rates of dysfunction and death compared to healthy controls. The explanation is in dysfunctional deiodination. 
because the diagnostic criteria completely ignore T3, which we know correlates with symptoms. And they completely ignore reverse T3, which we know correlates with dysfunction in death. In fact, I can find no authoritative review or meta-analysis that has examined T3 treatment. In fact, I can't find T3 treatment written on it. So we ask, can giving T3 plus T4 achieve the benefit these subclinical patients fail to receive from T4? And from my experience with my patients, I will tell you absolutely, yes, it will. So here's a final clinical challenge before we wrap. Dysfunctional deiodination might cause problems when people are euthyroid. They have a normal TSH. Oh, but symptoms of low thyroid. And if you test them, they've got a normal free T4 and a normal free T3, but oh, they've got a low total T3 reverse T3 because of that dysfunctional deiodination. Now, some practitioners are bold enough to offer thyroid treatment, usually natural, <clears throat> to symptomatic patients with normal TSH. And that perplexes the authorities. They don't get it. But these providers believe they are treating resistance to thyroid hormone, abbreviated RTH. And it definitely exists. Here's an excellent review by Refetoff and his colleague. And there are four major types. There are mutated thyroid hormone receptors, both alpha and beta occur, called Refetoff syndrome. And there are about a thousand cases worldwide, okay? Um, also, there are mutated transmembrane thyroid hormone transporters, both uh, monocarboxylase transferase 8 and organic acid uh, transfer protein 1C1. Uh, neither one of these, by the way, responds very well to thyroid hormone treatment. Uh, there is a really severe hereditary dysfunction of the adenase enzymes. Nine families identified. It's about as rare as the transport uh, mutations. And it's usually severe, but lo and behold, T3 treatment bypasses the defect and these kids can survive and thrive. And then there's the one I mentioned earlier, a mutated DIO2 gene from my homies in Britain. It's in 16% of their DNA. And these people have mildly impaired type 2 deiodinase function, so they just don't do well on T4 alone. And they may not do well when they're stressed. So I call this type 2 hypothyroidism, like type 2 diabetes, with uh, normal insulin, but it's not working, normal T4, but it's not working. So how can we validate it? Well, we know the T4 treatment only fails to help some patients. I think we've made that point. And the concept of euthyroid 6 syndrome has left the critical care unit and is now applied to ambulatory people who walk into our offices complaining of chronic fatigue. Also, a low T3 RT3 ratio has been demonstrated in patients with otherwise unexplained thyroid symptoms like chronic fatigue. We also, would expect to see symptoms in patients with conditions that we know are related to dysfunctional deiodination, such as euthyroid Hashimoto's, and we certainly do. Also, T3 replacement, which bypasses the dysfunctional deiodination, then should restore a desirable T3 RT3 ratio. And this is proven as we prove it in our offices every day. So T3 treatment, can help when TSH and T4 are normal. And it's been shown in a wide variety of settings, animal research, ADHD in children with hereditary resistance to thyroid hormone, in depression, in dementia-related behavior problems, in heart failure, in toxin-induced euthyroid 6 syndrome, and just low metabolism. So wrapping it up, I'm gonna review my four most important points. Thyroid hormone doses, must be divided every 12 hours, and I hope it doesn't sound so crazy to you right now. Therapeutic blood levels should be tested according to peak and trough variations, preferably at mid-dose. The ratio of total T3 to reverse T3 is the most accurate measure of the actual thyroid hormone function in the body. And some people may need to take T3 along with T4 to get their best clinical results. And let me give you patient five to show you what kind of results you can obtain by just doing the simple things I've told you. She came to me at age 39. She had a much stressed childhood, got PCOS in her teens. At age 30, she was hypothyroid because of hash. They gave her levothyroxine, it didn't help her, it hadn't helped her mother. 
They gave her armor and it worked for her as it had for her mother. But at age 32, she was told, you're never going to have a child. Forget about it. Her menses completely stopped when she was 35. Now, at age 37, they tested her twice, and she had immeasurably low estradiol. They couldn't find any. And her LH and FSH were inappropriately low, so there's some hypothalamic dysfunction here from chronic stress. Uh, at age 38, they stopped her thyroid treatment for a month just to see if she's really hypothyroid. And I don't know about you guys, but it's really rare for me to see free T4 and free T3 values that low. The TSH was only 18, so again, I think there is a hypothalamic component. When I first saw her, she was taking levothyroxine, 75 micrograms once a day in the morning. Somebody gave her T3 knowing you should divide the dose, but they gave her twice as much in the morning, five micrograms, but it wasn't even 12 hours later. So despite this, theoretically okay treatment, she had lots of symptoms of low thyroid, low adrenal, low ovarian hormones, and of low blood sugar. She was kind of a mess. Random tests done three months earlier had showed no measurable TSH, although the T4 and T3 looked pretty much okay. So I made two changes only. I said, start neonatal bovine adrenal glandular to support your brain, your adrenals, your ovaries, and all the organs that convert cholesterol to steroids like your mitochondria, and evenly divide your daily thyroid doses. Now, it turns out that 60 milligrams of natural thyroid every 12 hours gave her virtually exactly the same hormones that she was getting from her T4 and T3. We wrapped two prescriptions into one and evenly divided it. So we saved her money and effort. Four weeks later, she had her first period in five years. And after that, she had regular monthly cycles. She got married at age 40 and got pregnant on her honeymoon. And she developed, delivered an extremely welcome, healthy baby boy on Valentine's Day when she was 41. And there's my man on his third birthday with his pet brontosaurus. So look, I would love working with the thyroid gland, even if I did not personally have Hashimoto's myself. And I hope that you guys can find this work as totally rewarding as I do without being motivated by needing to treat yourself with it. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak.